Alright guys, we're back in part uh, three to this uh, pediatric series, and then we're going to talk about the ABCs in very specific and making sure that you, you do those and assess those correctly. Okay, uh, again, your your top priorities, once you make sure you do your, your pediatric assessment triangle, which is your appearance, work of breathing, circulatory status. This is the actual airway breathing and circulation that I'm talking about in this. Uh, again, Guys, 99% of the time, your BLS is all you really need for your patients uh, to control the airway, okay? I can't stress that enough. Uh, Dr. Frank, by the way, is hugely against pediatric intubation, and with good reason. Long and short, we usually end up moving more damage than good when we're sticking the laryngoscope back there, okay? There's very rare exceptions to that, but most of the time, you don't have to intubate the pediatric patient, Okay. And again, even when you do have to intubate them, it's a tough to stay in there. It is even tougher to actually do it. Uh, again, it, just stay away from the pediatric intubation unless it's an absolute thing that you absolutely have to do. Uh, again, remember to support the, the upper torso with the shoulders. Again, we're going to keep it up. Uh, when we do have foreign body airways, I would say that's the only time we should be sticking a laryngoscope in there with a set of McGill forceps. And then again, if it's a partial airway obstruction, again, make sure that they're ventilating and get them going to the hospital immediately. Uh, remember, abdominal thrust uh, until the item is expelled uh, for children, and if the victim does become unresponsive, you're going to do start CPR. I will tell you that this is one of my favorite scenarios to give you guys and pals, is, is to give you guys a kid with a penny, uh, with a, an infant with a penny in their mouth, and it's amazing how many people fail it. Because they simply don't follow the steps. Air are going in and out. The air is not going in and out. you got to fix that problem. Okay? So if you bag and the air don't go in, you reposition. And if the air still doesn't go in, think obstruction. And you need to take a laryngoscope and go in there and make sure nothing's in there. Okay? You might not get to see the vocal cords, but you'll definitely see if there's a penny in there or a nickel, or a dime, or a small object. So you could definitely do that. So again, to clear an infant's airway, again, uh, look for difficulty breathing, ineffective call for the strong cry, five back blows, I can't believe he's pimping his kid out like this, five chest thrusts, this is how we would normally do this. And of course, the kid's not going to be awake during said time. Hopefully they're not awake during this time. Uh, but if they are awake, they're, they truly have this, five back blows, five chest thrusts, and repeat. And then, wow, boy, that's really pimping the kid out. When you're uh, when the when the child becomes unresponsive, again, you start CPR. Okay, so again, five back blows, five chest thrusts. We just went over that. If it's a child, again, abdominal thrust until they go unresponsive, and then again, you would start CPR on them. Uh, suctioning, boy, is that a key thing in your pediatric patient? The bulb syringe for the really tiny ones. Uh, the flexible tip catheters uh, work okay to get the the liquidy snotty stuff out but your rigid tip is gonna it, it depends on the age size and what you're actually suctioning okay uh usually uh under the age of one i go for the bulb syringe okay and three quarters of the time you have to go into the ob kit to get it again really uh a, a bulb syringe costs the it, pennies on the dollar it, it, i don't understand why we we you should have a, that in your little pediatric area uh, that should be one of the things that you should have. Okay. Uh, again, uh, decrease your suction pressure because again, we want to remember it's 300 millimeters of mercury. You want to decrease that down if you're dealing with the infant uh, or, or a toddler. And again, the nasal suctioning video, um, I'll make it really simple for you. Make sure you push the bulb syringe out, stick it in their nose, and then let the suction come back in. Don't squirt it in their nose. Okay. Squirting it in the nose, really bad idea, okay? Now, your oxygenation. Um, Blow-by techniques, kind of the neonate techniques, but you could use it in the in the pediatric patient. Um, letting just the, turn it up to high flow, let it just kind of go across the face and the, the nose and the mouth, okay? Uh, again, if they can tolerate it, again, if they if they don't want to wear an honor breather mask, uh, again, it, it beats it beats nothing, so uh, let them overcome the fear of it. Uh, if you're putting an honor breather mask on a kid and they're not fighting it, I would be um, extremely scared. Okay, 
So use your ad airway adjuncts uh, if the prolonged artificial ventilations are going to be required. So again, notice how he's explaining, the, hey, this is how we're going to do this. And again, that's a really good, if you got a teddy bear, by the way, you doing it on teddy bear works really good as well, okay? Again, your OPAs, again, make sure that you size these things out correctly. Same thing with the nasal pharyngeal airway. Uh, make sure that you use a tongue. Remember that they got that floppy tongue for an OPA. So make sure I always use a tongue depressor when I'm when I'm putting in, putting the uh, OPA in. Uh, make sure that you ain't got no snot or dried boogers in the nose when you're going down a nasopharyngeal airway. Um, just make sure that you do that. Uh, your ventilations, easy, easy, easy. Go to your C chest rise and stop because if you go any further, it's going to go in the tummy, and then we're going to have more problems. Okay. So, again, remember that 7 cc's per kilogram, they only weigh 5 kilos, that's 35 milliliters of air. Just a bare squeeze, that's all you got to do, okay? Make sure that the mask is covering the mouth and the nose, not the eyes, not the everything else, okay? If you've got a mask that's going across their eyes or going past their chin, it's the wrong size mask, find the right one, okay? Again, the, vo the ventilations, you want to get chest rise that's all you really need okay uh don't use a fro pod on these guys again flow restricted oxygen device and don't use bvms with a pop-off valve okay unless they can be readily occluded and the reason being is is because some patients do require additional pressure to get especially the the neonates and the infants require that little bit of pressure and you really have to go by the compliance that you're feeling as you're properly ventilating this patient uh, cricoid pressure can help reduce it, eh, sort of, kind of, that kind of went out with the 2020 guidelines, by the way. So, again, a, a correct positioning to avoid hyperextension in the neck, boy. And, again, a, a good example, this is the, providing the Celix maneuver. Uh, yeah, that puts a lot of hands down in an area that we don't have a, a lot of room for. Uh, again, uh, ALS procedures, very rarely, if it's a foreign body, I, I would say go in, get it, Okay. Use your McGill forceps, pull it out if you can't. Uh, try to innovate around the object. Um, I I actually know of a case where we actually had to push the, the there was a small object that we actually pushed down into the lung uh, that had to do it that way. But I would not highly recommend that. So again, uh, just try to, again, get the object out the best way that you possibly can. Uh, if the foreign body cannot be removed with McGill forceps, uh, you need to really consider performing a needle crike on these kids and that should be of course a last resort and uh again you are allowed to do the needle crike but i will also tell you boy yeah get ready to answer a lot of questions with that guy okay um again pediatric intubation we've already gone over that really good uh guys they do make these other airways the combi tubes uh, uh they do make lmas this small you really got to make sure you've got the right size okay um, and I would say, again, the, 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 these other, the eye gels, make sure, again, that you've got the right size. It's on the packaging. Uh, and, and make sure, like I said, just make sure you got that right size. Because if you're putting one in and it's too big, it's not going to work. Okay. Uh, straight blades are usually preferred. Uh, I think we kind of hit that one already. Oh, that little formula right there. Oh, God, I love this little formula. Yeah, you're going to probably see this little formula in the future. Uh, getting the right size ET tube. Again, we usually go off of the pinky finger. Uh, that's usually the best way. But if we ask for a formula of this, take their age and years, add 16 to it, take that total number, divide it by 4. That's what tube size. So if it's a 4-year-old, that's 20 divided by 4. They're going to usually take a size 5 ET tube. That's the best method, by the way. And you're determining depth is direct visualization. Once the little black part gets past the vocal cords, stop. Okay? Can't stress that one enough. Once the cuff just goes past the vocal cord, if you're using a cuff tube. We only use a cuff tube usually about a size five and a half or higher. And we have to be able to monitor the cuff pressures, which a lot of times we can't do in the back of the truck. Guys, just enough to make a seal if you're using the cuff tube. Don't blow that thing up with 500 million cc's of air, okay? Just enough to make a seal, okay? And again, usually it requires constant monitoring, okay? Uh, didn't mean to. So again, this is an example of a pediatric intubation. Uh, 
again. Nice, gentle, easy. Notice that she's not lifting that hard. Okay. Okay. You can check out the stylus. And they pull the, the stylus in position until taped securely. There you go. All right. So again, if you'd have to do advanced uh, advanced breathing with this, uh, again, once you do get the once you do get the tube secured, of course, you need to make sure you secure it. Uh, I think we're all good with our airway stuff. Uh, always, again, ventilate with 100% oxygen. And if ever you were going to use the make sure you don't go more than 20 seconds on an intubation, this is definitely it. They're going to go hypoxic really quick, okay? Uh, we all know how to do the intubation. I'm not going to lovely fast forward through all these lovely things. Uh, but this little guy right here, I would highly recommend that you know. And we should be using this on every time we have an ET2 problem. Displacement, obstruction, pneumo, equipment failure. By the way, the very first thing we usually do is start bagging them because if it's equipment failure, uh, we want to make sure that it's not the equipment failure. And then we can rule out these other things, okay? So again, anytime you're having problems, take them off the vent, put them on your bag where you can actually feel things, okay? Um, again, ET tube malpractice is a ma it's a major thing. You don't have guys. I can't stress this enough. Put the cap no on, even especially on these little ones. Put the cap no on. Put the cap no on. Put the cap no on. Okay, because that's what's going to save you. If you've got a bad patient that's got good cap no, that means that tube's in something. Okay, and it means the tube is where it's supposed to be, and it definitely helps your case. Um, we've done RSI. Remember, just we got really small drug doses, and we're doing it on pediatric patients. Okay, um, again. Usually, succinylcholine is our is our choice for that. Um, and again, uh, as far as the sedative agent, uh, again, Versed works really good. Uh, ketamine works very well. So uh, I would uh, be careful with the Tomidate, especially if they have a fever or a septic patient in the kid. Okay. Uh, extraglottic airways again, uh, they're easy to insert, uh, but make sure you got the right size. Okay. As usual, the tracheal intubation is the gold standard for those, okay? Uh, nasogastric intubation, uh, again, this is for running down an NG tube. Uh, if you're going to do that, the kids should be able to swallow. Uh, and you really need to make sure that it's going into, it's amazing how when you go nasogastric tube, how it can go into the, uh, the trachea when an, when an ET tube will not. So again, make sure that you got the presence of gastric distension in the unresponsive patient. Usually we fill it with air. We see the coming kind of come up a little bit, then you can suction this stuff out. Okay? And again, if you're putting pre you're putting pressure in there, believe me, it'll come back on you. I, I assure you, it'll come back pretty quick. All right? Uh, any type of facial trauma, by the way, NG tube is 100% out. Okay? So don't go sticking things up tubes with facial trauma in kids. All right? Again, uh... Pediatric patients, if they got, oops, sorry, next slide there. Uh, again, these are all the equipment that you're going to need. Uh, again, you want to listen with the stethoscope. Again, usually a newborn is an 8 French. The adolescent 16, gauge it by the size of the nostril is usually your 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 biggest. Sorry, Gary, guys, I had to do a little splice in there because I accidentally stopped a little bit too early. Uh, circulation, again, guys, uh, when we're... The IV techniques are kind of the same. We just use a smaller needle, of course. External can be used, external jugglers can be used on these kids. Uh, remember, the feet are kind of in play on the kids. Um, an IO is a proper for treating a pediatric patient, not a neonate, not a neonate, not a neonate. Okay. Uh, again, uh, so again, your IO effusion. If you've got existing shock or cardiac arrest, unresponsive, if they're septic. And uh, and you have unable to get a IV started on these kids. Um, contraindications: if you got a bone fracture in that particular extremity, we've kind of gone over these when we did the IO stuff. Uh, we're good. Again, don't do it where you got a broken bone any part of the shaft because it's all going to leak out into the leg. Um, again, the IO perfusion is standard: a 16 or 18 gauge needle. Uh, again, usually use the correct one of 15 gauge is what we usually use for the IOs, uh, especially your easy IO or, or that size, okay? So we want to make sure that we put it in the bone marrow cavity, flush it appropriately. 
Uh, make sure you get a good flush there that it's free from uh, infiltrations. There's nothing coming out into the subcutaneous tissues, okay? Uh, pretty much, guys, if you can give it by IV, you can give it by IO, okay? So anything that you can give IV, you can give IO, all right? Uh, again, make sure that uh, you, your, your fluid boluses are calculated for these kids. 20 cc's per kilogram, except for a neonate. There are 10 cc's per kilogram. And then reassess, okay? 20 cc's per kilo, reassess. Guys, if they're in a hypovolemic state, if they're dehydrated, it may take 60, 80, 100 milliliters per kilogram to get them up to stuff, okay? So it's very important to understand that. So use the clinical response that you're getting. If I gave a fluid push and their cap refill was eight, and now it's six, and I give another one, and now the cap was, went from six to three, we're moving in the right direction. So keep using this. By the way, we usually use a mini drip on these guys. Uh, again, set your flow limits. Make sure that you don't overflow these kids. Uh, the thing called a Buretrol set, make sure you ask about that in lab, what a Buretrol set is and why we, are, we should be using it in our kids. All right. So again, make sure you correct the hypoxemia. Make sure that they're good and well ventilated. Uh, yes, they can cause circulatory problems and it accelerates the heart rate, which again causes problems. When kids get stressed, they go tachycardic. All right. Uh, again, uh, objects, uh, uh, objections to medical therapy. Uh, again, the correction of uh, we're using medication it, it, for circulatory responses. Again, we want to correct any type of acidosis. Usually, with good ventilation, we correct acidotic problems, okay? Uh, suppression of ventricular ectopy, maintaining renal perfusion, all these things we do. And make sure that you've got your length phase tape out and doing the medicines by the length phase tape. All of them are on the resuscitation tape. Uh, electrical therapy is 2 to 4 joules per kilogram of body weight. Uh, we start cardioversions at 1 joule, 0 0.5 to 1 joule, and then we go to 2 and 4. And then usually 4, 4, 4, 4, 4. There are some studies that say you can go up to 10. 2, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4 is perfectly fine, okay? Uh, but usually, in order to get them out of a problem, if you treat the hypoxia or the acidosis, 99% of the time, you're going to get them out of whatever problem they're having with electrical therapy. Okay? Again, uh, now we're going to hold up here because this is actually where I was supposed to stop. And we'll talk about that when we go to the management of the patients in the future. All right, guys. I'll see you on the next one.